Knockback, the retro and nostalgia podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Knockback. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my brother, Dagan, Dr. Shockaloo Moriarty. Dagan, thank you for joining me today. How are you? (laughs) I am naked. Yeah. (laughs) I was thinking about (laughs) I was thinking about doing the naked thing for this. You should have. I just just don't think it's my cup of tea, you know? I feel like some people could do that. Like Nick Scarpino could do that. I feel like that my my flavor is a different my flavor of comedy comedy is a different it's a different look. It's a little it's a little drier and a little drier. Um little less um I would say sexy. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, that's what I was gonna say. A little more, more, a little less risque. Let's say, uh, Dave, good to see you. Good to see you. This is Knockback, our weekly nostalgia and retro podcast. And you know, I've been really excited to do the particular topic we're d- going to do today, which we're going to get into in a little while. Let me just remind everyone. Of course, we're supported on Patreon, Patreon.com/slash Last Stand Media. More than twelve thousand of you support us there now. We really appreciate that. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. Early ad free access to every one of these shows, as well as our Xbox podcast, Defining Duke, our PlayStation podcast, Sacred Symbols, a bunch of other extras. Thank you again for your love, kindness, and support. You're the uh, best. Fan funded media. Yeah, they definitely. And Kyle, you know what? What the hell? The best. What's up? Mm. There we go. Whoa! Yep, I did it. So I'm not even sure. It looked like it looked like you had like pasties over your. I, like maybe I did. We we use Riverside, so sometimes it drops the quality to make sure the bandwidth is good, and then it sends the high quality away and. So like I, it almost looked like you were blur, not like not. I didn't see your nipples. I guess is what I'm saying. So you don't know if I'm really tan or if that was a chest wig, right? Or You'll if you find don't have any nipples, I don't remember that. You'll find out. I feel like I would remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Dick, I had a question I've been I've been thinking about before we get into the topic okay. here today, and and the topic is Grandma's Boy 2006 film, as you've seen when you hit play, and a movie I really love. Dagan has never seen, so I'm excited to get into it. I thought it would be a light. Still never saw it. Uh, it's still never, yeah, never <laughs> uh, it's a light episode after E3, kind of good for E3, a nice gaming movie, as it were. But I've been thinking about this thing. I don't know. I, I just wanted to present this to you as broad as possible just to get your your take on it. Sure. What do you think of the concept of the enemy of my enemy is my friend? Mm. What do you think of just broadly? Like, I've been thinking about that concept a lot lately for some reason. And just the idea of like a delineation of things that are important to you such that people or institutions or organizations or whatever you don't like, you'll actually affiliate with in order to destroy your common enemy sure. or root against your common enemy or best your common enemy or whatever. What do you think of that? It, it's so I find it so interesting just because um, I don't know. I, I, I'm finding myself in league with in my in my mind as I in my intellectual pursuits let's say yeah with all sorts of different people and i've been thinking lately that i just can't figure out what ties them all together except for the fact that they all seem to dislike like the identitarian movement the you know the idea of delineating everyone between skin color and really you know whatever religion and right country and nationality whatever and i was realizing that is it wor- like usually it's like populist right and populist left in this in this regard, not to get too political. But and I was wondering, like, wow, would I affiliate with with, say, a group to um, pass Medicare for all something that would be like totally, you know, against the grain for me in order that we might strengthen immigration or, um, you know, may have a more nationalist economic policy or whatever. Sure. And I was just thinking about that, like how so how how. How do your how far would your um I guess would you bend in order for the enemy of your enemy to be your friend? That's a really interesting concept. I mean, the first thing I think of when you say it, it you see it in all walks of life. It is a very authentic real life concept or thing that happens where two maybe seemingly unlike parties would join in opposition of a third party that they both oppose. Um so it is interesting. You know, it's one of the first things I thought of. There was a kid in elementary school I didn't like. His name was George. Talked about him on the podcast before. Won't mention his last name, but I'm tempted to. <laughs> 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 but we'll let bygones be bygones for me and George. Yeah, but sure. 
we just never really got along. And we had common friends, so we were forced to play together on the playground and stuff like that. But, you know, if it came down to me and George, me and George would never be seen hanging out just together, just me and George. There would always have to be Jason or Eric or other people around also. We just had a problem with each other. And I think I always sensed that he had a problem with me. So just in, you know, in exchange, I had a problem with him. And, but there was a bully who is a two, year or two older than us. And I've mentioned him on the podcast before, this guy, Corey, who I later went on to become friends with when we got older as teenagers. Super cool guy. But when he was little, he used to pick on, when we were little, he used to pick on me endlessly. And I remember George and I having to like band together against this guy, like on the bus, on the bus to certain field trips or on the playground in the cafeteria, wherever we kind of ran into this guy or crossed paths with Corey. And I remember that being the first sort of thing in my life where it was like, yeah, you and George, you know, me and George had to kind of stand shoulder to shoulder against this bully. And it was like, you know, in order to defend ourselves. So we found that common ground, which was mm -hmm. interesting. In, in general, I think of like, there's a lot of nuance and, comp you know, it's kind of a complex issue because there's so much to weigh there, right? Like if you want to align yourself with a certain side that maybe you wouldn't normally align yourself with, you have to think about the overarching good versus bad, right? Weigh the positive versus negative. Like are you aligning yourself with said entity in opposition of something that's more important than the other things that you don't share common ground on or that you don't want to affiliate yourself with. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuance to that. I think it probably takes courage. I think sometimes maybe desperate measures call for that, mm. but you know, it's certainly like, you know, it's certainly an interesting concept uh, you know, we, I think we talked about it recently, a podcast or two ago when it came to, um, you know, people in a certain place, like people in a certain demographic, people of a certain nationality, people of a certain nation, whatever, banding together in wartime, right? We certainly saw that with the Axis allies and the ally countries, you know, coming together to form or to oppose a certain enemy or, or stand their ground against a certain threat. So that's an interesting, that's a really, that's a really heady concept. I wasn't expecting to go here with the grandma's yeah. boy topic. I have to say, no, I like no, the contrast. It's, it's, it, yeah, it's definitely a contrast. I, I... <laughs> I, World War II obviously is the epitome of this for both sides. Like sure. you said, the Germans had to twist themselves into a pretzel to, to justify allying with the Japanese and w would call them the Aryans of Asia and stuff. So the, it, it, it's just, it's an interesting kind of concept. And I, I, of course, think about it for our side too. Famously, we had to put aside our differences with the communists to fight the Nazis. And I, I liked that just because obviously that's a greater evil, but also... Um, the, we kind of were like, we'll we'll deal with each other later, and then we did for decades. There and decades. you go, exactly. And not in any, not in any uh productive way. But yeah, I just had, I guess, this parliamentary style European philosophy kind of eking into my brain lately, just in realizing as I've been absorbing all of this different content that I've never really listened to before. Um, Jimmy Dore on YouTube, I've been listening a lot to. Um. I've been listening to Sagar and Crystal a lot, which is a great show. Um, they do a show called Breaking Points now. They used to do a show called Rising. So it's just a lot of, and you realize like there's just commonalities, not only in the way we all feel about many things, but also just in how much we loathe the people that insist on shoving this shit down our throats to the, to the detriment, I think, of our betterment as a society and the way we're going forward. I have a real problem with it. So it's really it was nice to see that there are so many people on, quote unquote, that side that do it as well. And therefore, everything's kind of being redrawn in such a way that it's hard to know if the enemy of the of your enemy is your friend or what is going on over there. I think the greater thing is, is that we don't really know what the political alignments look like anymore. And that's fascinating. And of course, I was thinking about it in terms of sports as well. I root against the Patriots very actively. I root against the Red Sox very actively. Anyone who's playing the Red Sox, I'm hoping they win. So right. it goes there, you know, um, anyway, I just wanted to ask you about that before we get into this much lighter topic. Dig. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to talk about today? I mean, usually we throw things back and forth here. I no, just, I, I mean, I think monopolize. that's, a, I think that's a fascinating way to start the show. You know, I also think of just like politics. Mm. I've been thinking about this, like, mm. especially in the United States, insofar as politics in general, the way 
people, Americans especially, probably all, all over the world to some extent, have been at loggerheads politically, you know, left versus right, liberals versus conservatives, how bad it's be, been over the last few years, how polarizing mm -hmm. and how divisive it's been, that, you know, maybe what you're saying is the connective tissue to that sort of open-mindedness or that willingness to bend a little bit for certain causes or beliefs or whatever, maybe that's kind of the connective tissue between an age where we're much less divided politically, a new open-mindedness, say. Now, I don't know if that's the optimist in me speaking, but, you know, that's certainly something to consider. Like, maybe that's the, you know, that's the middle ground into, you know, connecting to an age where, you know, we're more prone to maybe find common ground or agreement rather than disagree on everything. Maybe we put that as the preeminent posture, like, let's see what we could find. Let's see what common beliefs we, you know, let's see what we all want to stand for, you know, that sort of thing. Mm. So that's really interesting because that's been, on, it's, it's, it's a funny coincidence because that has been on my mind lately, just sort of like, I think just naturally the way life works, like when something hits an extreme, it's likely to swing back the other way. You think of like being on a swing, like a kid on a swing set. Sure. You know, like now it's got to come back the other way. Like what goes up must come down type of thing. So that's, uh, that's funny. That's, that's, this is much more intellectual than I was expected to get today, but that's good for me. That's good well, for this old man. That, well, yeah, I don't know. I just, I just been thinking about that a lot lately and it does make sense. Yeah, it does. And I just think. I'm just, I don't know. I'm becoming really confirmed or concerned rather with. I don't know. I just see things today and read things and hear things. And I'm like, this is. This is racist, you know, or this is, <laughs> absolutely, you know, th but it's not what you think. It's right. like someone thinking that they're saying something really enlightened. Right. And I'm like, but. But that's racist. And. I, I date a black girl and she had some she's very nice so she doesn't get like I do on Twitter but she had a she had like a kind of a confrontation with someone where they were basically saying like you know Colin is this that or the other thing and she's like who the fuck are you basically to say a stranger that I'm dating like a racist man that's insane you know and and that's when you so I've been thinking about that a lot from that perspective too because it's been eye opening in some sense like people's assumptions and how they talk down to other people and assume they should or think something because of their skin color or whatever and i don't know right or so saying because you're conservative you're automatically racist that sort of thing the right. thing that kind of flies in the face of just common sense especially right, for exactly, those of us who know people of all stripes right that's you exactly know what right. i mean there's so much more nuance you can't you can't check all the boxes on one side that's just not a human being most people don't do that they have nuance they go you know, they have all different dimensions, all di a different set of beliefs. If you're conservative, maybe you don't tick all the boxes on one side. Maybe there are those boxes on the left that you tick and vice versa. Right. So, you know, that's that's always interesting to me. That what you just said has dawned on me since the last, you know, really in the run up to our election. Where, you know, it was is Biden versus Trump and just saying like, you know, like Trump supporter or not, like every Trump supporter was, you know, just a racist, you know. And it just, it just, to me, it defied common sense or my reality of what I knew because I knew Trump supporters that are not racist, you know, and vice versa. I knew Trump supporters that were hateful people too. So it's like, you know, it's just, I think it comes down to two, like just putting, maybe this is a little bit of a tangent, but just trying to put people in a box. It doesn't mm -hmm. work. You know what I mean? I think you should be, you should stand up for what you believe in. I mean, me you know, with race, I, you know, racist, any kind of racism or hatefulness is unacceptable to me, you know, but mm. just saying you're a Trump supporter, maybe you acknowledge, uh, maybe you did think Trump was hateful, but maybe you liked some of his economic policies, for instance, you know, that sort of thing. Like you can't just put everybody in a box. There's mm. just, and that really sort of is, is also la smacks of laziness because it just says you don't have to get to know the person. It gives you an right. excuse. It gets you off the hook for really exploring the depth of a person, you right. know, however little right. or however much depth they have or may, may or may not have. So, yeah, man, it's, um, yeah. I don't know. It all comes down to common sense for me, you know, for sure. I agree. I agree. I don't like the, a lot of the 
absolute absolutist talk you know, bad good you know stuff like that I just i don't know right anyway dig let's get into the the topic at hand now All grandma's right. boy is a topic that the audience has wanted us to do for a long time and i've wanted you to watch it for a long time but i didn't get any questions comments concerns thoughts and ideas from the audience like i usually would because i kind of want to spring this on the audience as a little bit of a post e3 surprise just a little conversation i i can't imagine we're gonna go incredibly long about grandma's boy but maybe we will so something a little easy for everyone to kind of digest in this post E3 era as we start playing our games again and wait for the future. So, Dig, I want to just kick it over to you right off the bat because you wouldn't even tell me any. I tried to talk to you about it this week, but you <laughs> said you wanted to save it for the show. So I'm curious, what, what did you think of the movie? So funny. I'm so happy we're getting a chance to do this. You know, an easy breezy topic, as you said, something really fun to talk about. It's almost ironic, like, right, like picking apart or analyzing like just a stoner comedy, which is the complete opposite of a film, not that they're not fun, not that they don't have depth, but something that really is just something simple, something that's not supposed to have too much texture, something that's supposed to be silly and fun. So I love the part of like, I love kind of the, the, the take of like pulling that apart, pulling stoner right. comedies apart, something like this. This is certainly an iconic one. You've mentioned this, this movie a lot on our, on our show and in our conversations. So I was really happy to finally get around to it because I had never seen it. And I just kind of looked at it in those kind of mid-2000s, mid-aughts comedies from like 2004 through like, let's say, 2007. And it's certainly, you know, there's a lot of stoner comedies, sort of like, you know, those kind of silly, gross-out comedies. That whole genre was really big during this era, of course, this film being from 2006. And it fits right in with all those ones that you would think about. You know, the Harold and Kumars, Anchorman, Dodgeball... Wedding crashes. Yeah, 40 year old virgin. Oh, yeah. 40 year old virgin, of course. Super, you know, super fly. All of those kind of thing. Uh, super bad, rather. Super fly. Super also. bad. <laughs> super, super bad, also. Yeah, super fly as well. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, all of those. Clerks, too, of course, came out during that time. So I loved just talking about, I found this to be the perfect stoner comedy. You know, kind of in a lot of ways what I was expecting, but also sort of the nerd culture aspects the video game sort of the whole video game aspect to the to the film was kind of surprising i didn't know it took place in that that kind of setting with those type of characters and just everything you would expect silly over the top exaggerated fun again uncomplicated easy breezy but also i found because i watched it twice all the way through and then i watched clips and i found out much to my surprise and amusement that it's one of those movies that's definitely funnier in even in retrospect like the first time you watch it you're like this is really funny then you watch it then you think about it and it's funny and then you watch it again and it gets even funnier it's one of those and it's just on repeated viewings it just holds up so well it's that sort of stupid comedy the goofiness the lightheartedness again just like kind of a just kind of a joy to to behold nothing sort of just really just to the complete escapist movie a nice hour and a half of just being able to have fun and laugh at these performances and these characters and the characters are kind of relatable like we know people like that but they're just taken to the nth degree you know they're exaggerated yeah, for comedy super definitely. fun i really really enjoyed it and i have other things to say about it too criticisms and stuff that are not you know huge nitpicks but sure. I was fine for me. I know it's one of your favorites. It seems like a go to comfort movie for you. And it's yeah, definitely cool to finally be in the be in the loop. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I'm i glad you liked it. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. This is a pretty likable movie. I knew. So this movie came out when I was in college. So it always reminds me of that. And it has a lot of different tethers to it, too. It's the gaming industry thing. It's a total parable about the gaming industry. And we can get into that. It's also. <laughs> Uh, and I think that a lot of people don't examine it from that point of view. And it totally is, whether it's intended or not. I think so. And so it, and it, and I love that you in, it brought up the mid aughts. Everything about it, from the soundtrack to the silhouettes of the characters, I was talking to Micah about like, wow, I, there's a picture where, or there's a shot where um, Alex is standing outside of the office waiting for some car, like his gr grandma to pick him up or whatever. And he, just the way he's shot with his, 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 his like etnies on or something and like, you know, bag, I'm like, this is exactly the way I dress. So much. Yeah. You know. So it has a lot of different connections. The gaming connection, I think it's, for me, a, a big connection is the Adam Sandler connection. I'm a huge fan of this ensemble. I think they're fucking hysterical, these guys. And I love the restraint. And I remember watching it the first time, too. The, the complete restraint that Adam Sandler's not in it at all. Now, it's not that's not uncommon. You know, um, 
his production company they do a bunch of stuff without him they did like they do, they do most of the stuff without him actually but this just seemed like a movie where he would have popped up at some point and the reason i say that is because i feel like some of the guys closest to him and his ty- type of comedy alan covert Sh- shirley and peter dante obviously these guys are fucking hysterical and are way funnier actually with sandler in there so that expectation of maybe seeing him the first time would have been fun and then of course there's all of the different people that pop up kevin nealon is awesome in this he's hysterical you see Jonah Hill in this, which I think is funny. So funny. Rob Schneider and David Spade have cameos in this as well, which are really funny. And there's some really good performances on the sides, too. Nick Swartzen's really funny in this. Doris Roberts is a joy in this. Oh, she's so uh, good. Linda Carlini, Cardellini's in this, who uh, obviously I love. I mean, she's <laughs> amazing in so many different ways. We, we gush about her specifically on Mad Men, for which I think she won an Emmy for that role. So it's funny to see her in this as well. But... uh I think what's so funny about this the most for me and as I was writing notes as I was playing it, I took so many notes, like a shocking amount of notes because it was just I just kept writing down quotes. <laughs> and usually I try to just let a movie run. I want to experience it. I want to let it wash over me. If I don't quite understand something, I kind of like that because I want to see it in a way where it's like, oh, I'm seeing it and I can talk about it and kind of examine it without getting too deep into the weeds and going on IMDb and shit like that. But this was one of the rare movies where I kept rewinding it because I wanted to keep writing down quotes and I wanted to make sure I got them right. What did you think of the, I guess, the relative silliness of it? You had kind of brought it up, but this movie, I think more than even its contemporaries in some way, makes no sense. And I think that's what's so funny about it. It's not really an in, insight uh, in like how games are made. It's not really insight into anything. It's just a dumb 90 minute movie that ends on a silly note. You don't even really know how it ends or what happens. And I feel like it's a little bit... um above in some way in that regard even a a movie like 40 year old virgin that has like a payoff and kind of a real world in it or uh whatever the case might be it it, it reminds me a little bit more of like hot tub time machine or something a little more ethereal where it's almost like wow did this even did this even happen this is so weird so (laughs) that's a great point yeah so what do you what do you make about the whole structure of the film and what it's about obviously just this guy washing out in his 30s with his friend who's obsessed with filipino hookers and he has to go live with his grandma because he's out of money or whatever. I mean, that's it. I love that because you know what it is. It spoke to me as, a, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it is kind of the prototypical stoner film. But in a lot of ways, it's different, too. It has, you know, it has a lot of originality sort of embedded because it is sort of a film like a lot of these films probably are that's built on moments, right? It's built on comedic moments and probably even structured around writing those really funny one liners. And bits of dialogue. Sure. And I know that Covert and Sandler and all the people that that wrote this, you know, sort of built it on those moments and even added ad lib because they realized how much the dialogue was really kind of special and funny in the moment. But I kind of like it because, you know, you have these characters that a lot of this type of movie would center around. You have sort of the the grown man children, the slackers working in the video game industry, but it's usually, you know, eating Cheetos on the couch, playing video games. They're sort of in their mid thirties. A lot of them probably in their, in their twenties too. You have the Jonah Hill character and the other younger, you know, set of characters, but you know, they're slackers, but they are professionals, but they're working in the video game industry. They're not, they're slackers because, you know, usually you would have this type of character. They would be hard pressed for money. They weren't making a lot of cash. They were, you know, the cold pizza on the couch from the night before and they were, you know, hung over from the party, you know, that weekend prior and all that kind of stuff, maybe had dead end jobs. But these are guys working in the video game industry. They're more grown man children and, you know, living at home, for instance, the Jeff character living at home and referring to his parents as his roommates and the car (laughs) bed and the footy pajamas and all that really funny stuff because again, just kind of again, lampooning, you know, the, the grown nerd. The, the grown video game obsessed man child and the whole movie just seemed to be built on those moments you know the everything that would go hand in hand in that universe you know the drug deal, dealer character the hot chick that comes in who's not nerdy but who's kind of nice and patient and kind and sympathetic to the nerds so kind of like the nerd dream girl type character and you know the the boss who doesn't really get how ridiculous he is and you know, the parents that sort of enable the man children and the, and the doting grandma, like that whole world just felt, 
it just felt authentic, even though it's comedic, it's obviously pushed for comedy, you know, stuff like that. But it just felt, I think that's what makes it funny because we know people like that. Maybe we've even been in situations like that, you know, living at our grandma's house. I lived at grandma's house in my twenties and it was a similar thing. I would commute to New York. That was my apartment was the upstairs of grandma's house. I would commute to my jobs in New York, but you know, sort of had the, the, the beater car at that point. You're not making a ton of money. Um, you're trying to get it together. And I think that speaks to like, even more so than the Gen Xers and the generation I came up in, I think that maybe speaks to the millennials on up, like being at home longer, taking a little more time to find your footing, your career, mm. getting a, you know, moving up the ladder, all that kind of stuff. So I really, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it, it, it's a quick watch. I think the characters are very genuine. You know, you get the, who the characters are, even though they're hilarious. And I did find myself sort of relating to a lot of the characters like oh that's kind of like this guy i grew up with or that's kind of like this guy i knew in the workplace 15 years ago and stuff like that so it was just really a lot of fun and i love the formula of sort of building a movie now i'm trying to think about it in the 2006 perspective but i liked building the movie around sort of these comedic character actors or stand-ups that were a little lesser known like in other bigger comedy movies you would have seen them in bit parts including guys like covert, you know covert and right. they sort of take the lead role and it seems like the bigger comedic talents or the bigger names took those cameo roles you know david spade kevin nealon um so on and so forth so that seemed kind of neat too i was even expecting to see adam sandler pop up maybe even ben stiller and guys of that caliber in those bit parts, which I think was a lot of fun to do that. You know, you kind of give Jonah Hill would go on to get big the next year in 2007, I think with super bad, but you know, it was nice to see the smaller guys playing the bigger roles. And then you had Linda Cardellini in there with her acting chops and just sort of the one woman besides the older ladies, you know, the, the, the sort of golden girls that we see, you know, sort of the one female character that's anchoring it. And again, sort of like, in a funny way, that sort of nerd fantasy girl, like super hot, but also super nice, like doesn't browbeat the nerds for being nerds. And maybe even find out she's a little bit of a nerd herself, which is like the right. ultimate and dork also, fantasy, you know. Also kind of a realistic um, archetype in the industry as well. Absolutely. You know? Sure. So I will give out a shot because he's never going to come up, but um, Kane, played by Kelvin Yu, I must point out, is like probably one of the most prominent people in this uh movie now do you know anything about him i was reading about him a little bit no. he apparently is like a he's apparently the executive producer and writer of bob's burgers oh is he been really nominated and won like a bunch of emmys for, for like or and nominated for like a bunch of them so he's like incredibly famous now i love i uh, love in the animation world he has that iconic gold toyota super which is supposed to be that's supposedly one of the cars from too fast too furious i think Oh, cool. But they played up all the Asian tropes with him. I feel like maybe he had a bigger part and they sort of like, you know, he was kind of the self-deprecating, like high pressure Asian character who maybe his parents expected like a lot out of like, I hate myself. I'm a piece of shit. Like that type of thing that I feel like they could have taken him further. But it was fun to see that younger generate him and Jonah Hill, like I think plays Barry there, they're, that younger generation of character in there with their kind of, you know, the older mid thirties man children are playing off of, which is fun because they're going to be the next wave, <laughs> you know? So what did you think of, um, Alex as a character? I, oh, I dude, he's so funny and he's likable. It's, it's cute because he's like 35 in this. So he's a little younger than I am now, but I was living with my mom when I was 35 for a few months when I was waiting for my house to be built. And I, I felt like it was very relatable in the sense that, He's going into the fridge late at night and like I was doing the same thing like when mom would be asleep I'd like sneak downstairs not even sneak just go downstairs and just eat and he was literally talking about how he's eating chicken cutlets and all that this is literally what I was doing <laughs> and it, it felt like it felt very Italian to me in some way but I like this character he's he's industrious and hardworking and he gets screwed by his roommate in the beginning which is really funny and just finds himself in this unusual situation I feel like Alan Covert's not the greatest uh actor but he's funny he's a funny cat he's not as funny as as dante who we'll talk about in a little while but what did you think about his performance i really liked him you know i spent the entire first viewing really kind of like torturing myself like who where do i know this guy from which was kind of, again kind of the fun because all the leads you're like you know you've seen them do a stand-up you know them you've seen them do bit parts in such and such movie but you can't really put your finger on it 
And for him, of course, I knew him from The Wedding Singer, which was, you know, he played Adam Sandler's best friend in that. And then I finally realized it. But it was again, it was kind of cool to see him as a role, in, you know, in a lead role and a prominent role as the protagonist. It was yeah, he plays the limo driver. It, it, oh, that's yeah. right. That's absolutely right. He played and he's Isn't very that 80s. Him? Isn't super that him? rocking. I'm yeah, old. I think the best friend is. Wait, is the best friend the limo driver in that? He plays Sammy in The Wedding Singer, I think. The Wedding Singer, I'm looking it up. I think I it's Sammy, if I'm so not mistaken. Uh, yeah, Sammy, Robbie's best friend. Right. You're right, yeah. And he is. He's involved in the whole wedding thing because he's like, you know, he's one of the people that people use in weddings and all that. And I was like, really, where is this guy? So it was cool. But I know what you're saying about that. He's one of those guys that he doesn't have that, like, you're wondering what his brand is. Like, he kind of, I feel like the same way about, you know, ironically about guys like Kevin Nealon. It's like, you know, I, you don't know exactly what the flavor of comedy is. He just kind of seems like an, like, he does a little bit of everything. You know, he does a little bit of writing. He does a little bit of stand-up. He's funny. He's kind of quick in the moment. He's, he's witty, whatever. I liked the character. I thought he was funny. I loved the, the fact that he's kind of obviously sheltered, like, he takes the spaghetti and all the, the chicken cutlets and all the things from the, the garlic bread and everything and puts them all on one tray and that doesn't know to wear oven gloves to get it out. Like just, you know, complete moron. But the thing I found myself finding with this, and if you think about like the typical stoner comedy, I think this comes up a lot. It's like you have this wacky world, this madcap world of characters who are kind of zany and, you know, naive and, and silly and you have this universe of the of this this world that's like over the top nutty almost like a cartoon and then you have the protagonist character and i feel like you could go two ways with it you could make that protagonist one of them like just as idiotic and silly and sheltered as the rest of the characters or you could kind of go the other way with it and make him a little more of a, of a regular joe like a little less over the top a little more relatable and set him in that world of craziness, which is funny. I feel like they could have taken this. I feel like they did that a little bit in the beginning of the movie. He's masturbating to the Barbie doll, and, you know, which is like supposed to be like the Lara Croft, the off-brand yeah. Lara Croft doll or whatever. <laughs> and he does all this crazy shit in the beginning. And then they kind of, you know, sort of immerse him deeper into that crazy madcap world. And they sort of pull back on him and make him look, you know, more normal where I feel like, they kind of didn't know they, they were a little inconsistent with the character. It would have been kind of funny to make, you know, either really pull back on him or to make really sort of exaggerate him. And I feel like they kind of landed somewhere in the middle. And again, I think it's kind of a movie. It's not a Stanley Kubrick movie, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. It's not supposed to be, again, built on moments, you know, put together like Lego bricks you know, on moments and character interactions and bits of dialogue. So, but I think, you know, he was really, really likable. I actually watched Alan Covert in, you know, different interviews on Conan appearances, you know, then and now. So 15 years ago to more contemporary stuff that he's done. And he's pretty funny. You know, he's a good storyteller, but he's not, you know, maybe, you know, arguably there's probably Alan Covert fans out there, super fans out there, but he's not a Will Ferrell. You know, he's not the guys that, you know, he's not a Robin Williams. He's not the guys that like are or were at the top of their game, but he's a, you know, he's a serviceable dude. He did a good job in this movie. I thought it was a lot of fun and he seems like an every dude, you know, he doesn't seem like if Robin Williams played this part, it would be like, all right, you know, this guy's not a regular guy, you know, he's too much of a name. Like, it's nice that he kind of, he kind of blends in. He's believable in the role, you know, which is fun. Yeah, that's a good point, actually, that you almost wouldn't. If you need to, as much as you need to believe his role in this, so you wouldn't believe it maybe as easily. Yeah, I think he does a nice job. I love the beginning of it because it kind of establishes everything you need to know. They're huge game nerds and stoners. I love um, Rob Schneider coming in <laughs> and he's like, he's like, this is bullshit. It smells like a Cypress Hill concert in here, which is so such a great line. He was great. And and uh, he, you know, they dropped the bong. And he says, maybe if you cleaned it, it wouldn't smell like your girlfriend's ass, which is another <laughs> <laughs> another great line and this is one this is like you said it's it's a movie structured around just one liners and non sequiturs which is so funny like you think about the character of um of jeff and living at home and in the car bed and the fo footy pajamas like that's all just something that they thought was funny and so, so they had good. to figure out a way to get that in and so on and so forth and 
so uh, I do think that Al and Covert, as Alex kind of weaves his way into all these people's lives in a way that is believable and grounded. And, and for me anyway, as a 30 mid thirties stoner in the gaming industry, somewhat relatable, I suppose. Um, but I have to kick it over and ask you about Dante, uh, played by Peter Dante, another famous Sandler um, entourage character, character actor. This is one of my very favorite characters in, I think, any comedy, <laughs> probably like top five for me from the very like every scene he's in. That guy, he plays. First of all, he's an awful actor. It's awesome because he just plays the same person basically in every film that he's in. Like it's you can tell he's been around Adam Sandler a long time and they have the same kind of humor and him him answering the, the door when he's naked. And he was talking about how he's putting up his Christmas tree. And all of that and, and just invites me, you know, come on. Oh, I am naked. Come on in. Or what, it, so what did you think of that whole? I, I love the whole. It's all structured in the basement as well. You only see them from that really one that one shot in his in his basement, so fun. which is hysterical. Yeah, so good. And one of those things, one of those things in the beginning where I'm like, this is this is kind of weird. But then when you think about it, it was so perfect, like seems like the 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 perfect West Coast stoner, especially like of that era of like the, the mid aughts era you know perfectly tan skin beautiful teeth he's kind of naked he's kind of unapologetic about being naked just really really comfortable in his very bohemian skin living in the basement you know he has a pet chimp that's learning karate with him like just everything he, he has his his like right hand man is like a witch doctor it's like <laughs> oh it's hilarious it couldn't be any funnier it was Dr. like Shockaloo. it's just <laughs> dr shockaloo <laughs> And then later on, we get maybe, arguably, one of my favorite characters, Mr. Lee Ho, which is like the be <laughs> fucking best scene ever, dude. I, I when he like screams at the bottom of the stairs, like does just all this staring thing. at him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. You know what I heard about that scene? That the guy who plays Doctor Shakalu. Let me see his name. It's uh, Abdullah. Engum and yeah, Nagam, Nam, I, I think Nagam. his name is. And Nagam. I only know that because I heard Peter Dante say it in an interview. He knows like seven, he's fluent in like seven languages in real life, including Cantonese or whatever Chinese that he was speaking. They surprised the actor. Let me look. Jen, Jen, uh, Kyu Song, who played Dr. Lee, uh, Mr. Lee Ho. They surprised him and didn't say that, you know, the Dr. Shock Lu character knew Cantonese. So, he just said that. And that's why you could see his reaction. He's like, what? You know, he's like really taken, <laughs> he's really taken aback when he's telling him, you know, that, that thing in Chinese, which is really funny. But yeah, that whole, that whole Dante character, I love the fact that they used Peter Dante's last name. I love the fact that he's gone on like con circuits in real life and, and, you know, really supportive of the movie and the fan base for this movie, which is a lot bigger than I thought it was. You know, I know that it barely made more money than it cost to produce initially it was like five million it made six million or something and then did astronomical in home video sales at that time i guess it really would be dvd sales. yeah because it came out during the dvd era where it was like the boom oh like everyone everyone owned this dvd i remember yeah pre-subscription service you know so maybe if you were cheapskate you were getting the netflix dvd but you, you were probably buying it for 15 bucks you know and one and it's so, so good on repeated viewing and you know I, I it speaks to me too like i'm not you know, a stoner, like I, I, I never smoked a lot of weed, but this must really be like the most joyful movie to just sit with your buds, with your guys and you, you, you and your gals, your dudes and just smoke a spliff and just watch a movie that's just completely silly. It must even take it to the next level of just hilarity, you know? I love, I'm, I'm trying to find the quote because I can't find it of when he speaks French. In that one scene, because he character? just does that, like uh, Doctor Shakalu, you know, and he goes like he says something. So he's like, "Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> like he says like right, like just like one of these like one of these scenes where he speaks perfect French, so good, and it's so. But it always in this in the um the script I'm finding it just says speaking French. I so love I can't, that character. I can't say, yeah, he's awesome, and Doctor Shakalu is amazing. Like everything about him is awesome. I tweet, I texted at you or tweeted at you, texted you rather yesterday. I was just like, we got to be careful, Doctor, because that's one of the great. <laughs> One of the great lines, because then it just shoots to his face and he just nods like knowingly, like he understands <laughs> everything. It's just a completely it's absurd. So and this weird. character, although I don't remember it, I was reading about it. 
he appears in That's My Boy, which is an Adam Sandler movie that happens later on. OK, I never um, saw that. And he comes in as a uh, father Shakaloo, apparently. And I don't re- I actually saw that movie, but I don't even remember that. So that's hysterical that they connected those. That's so two funny. universes. But yeah, I love Dante. I love the the thing about Dante that's relatable because we're talking about all the things that are grounded and we're talking about the parables of the gaming industry and all that. And we'll, we can talk more about that. But I've been smoking weed for a long time. Everyone knows that. And it's legal in most pla- or many places in the U.S. now. So we've not had to go, on, go through the hoops we used to have to go through to get it. And everyone know I, I had some weed dealers that I knew in college and in California before I had a medical card and then it became legal there where um, they were really nice people. But like you had weird relationships with them because it was like, do you stay? Do you go? Or do you want to smoke? Do you? I remember I, I, I think I've said before, I used to get weed from this one guy in Boston who was hysterical where he used to just throw his keys out the window when I'd get there. I'd call him on his on his cell phone and then he would, it would be on the fifth floor and he'd throw his keys to me and then I would just let myself in and go up. And that's like a really memorable thing because it's just like, wow, this is. And so for um, for these characters, this is their their tradition. And all weed smokers have some sort of especially in places where you can't get it uh, legally have some sort of tradition. They have the people they go to, the people they tolerate, the weird people in their lives. Some of them, you know, and I, I from that lens 15 years ago, I can relate to that, especially when the movie came out. I mean, I was in situations like that where it's like not with Dr. Shock, like, <laughs> where you're where you're like, you know, I kind wish. of beholden to someone or in weird situations or a kind of, you know, everyone who smokes can relate to that. And I, I really love how they kind of played that up. And that is one of the great things about the liberalization of marijuana in the last 20 years in the United States is like not having to do that anymore. Um, and also the precipitously falling price. But I sure. I absolutely uh, dig that character. And um, there's a great scene where and I've I so our brother in law, Derek, always thinks it's I'm the only person that thinks this is funny other than him, I think, which is that I always say like that guy gets it, you know, like like just like you just point to a <laughs> random guy. And that's and that's a very Adam Sandler thing. They do that in some of their movies. And they have another one of those in this where he's like, Dr. Shockaloo gets it. And they just and they and then they just it's just a shot of him like nodding or whatever. So I love that. And they just. um. They, I, I felt like with that character with Shakalu, it's on the border of where it's, it's, it's clearly a racist trope that they're playing up. Obviously, with this character, where I don't think they could do this character anymore without. It's a good point. Um, because they even have the thing. I love it when when he's walking away and he just says like, and doctor, and the, and the doctor just like looks at him. You know, it's like super racist. It's, it's but it's, but it's very funny and. I'm I'm so pleased that it all takes place in that just that one shot, that wide shot, basically with some with some ones of, um, of the the basement and the monkey and the, the lion and the neon that. signs. Yeah. This is like it's iconic, just, you know. And the, the Peter Dante character too. Legend had it that he was smoking real weed for his scenes. Now he has debunked that in interviews, but every time he he kind of debunks that, I'm not sure if he's joking or not. So maybe he really did. And he's he was a really big proponent in real life, too, for medical cannabis, marijuana, and all that kind of stuff, too, which is really interesting. He really seemed like the, the authentic surfer dude, West Coast drug dealer. And it is interesting, too, because he looks the part of the surfer dude with the, the you know, the pigtails and the tan and, like, you know, he just looks like the handsome surfer dude from films, you know, perfectly white teeth and all that kind of stuff. But they took him in a he's, different yeah. direction. But here's the thing, Kyle, that I wanted to ask you. And it goes back to the Alex character, too. I feel like, and again, this might be a hang-up with me. We talk about this sometimes on the show, certain things we talk about, but it feels like all the characters look a little too old. Like, the Alex character is supposed to be 35. To me right now, looking at you, you look so much younger than that guy. Like, he looks like the typical 40, mid-40s, 50-year-old dad that you would see in the hardware store. You know, right. like, he doesn't look young enough to me and then it goes back to peter dante too like he looks a little older like everybody just looks a little too old except for i would say you know the barry character and the kane character and stuff like that all the other characters look a little (laughs) too old to me does that do you have the same thing does it strike you the same way yeah it's this it's the it's the suspension of disbelief with it's like 902 and 0 when we always bring that up yes perfect what's her name um God, why can't I think of her name? Andrea. Andrea. She was 29. 29. While they were filming. In the first season of that. Holy shit. Yeah. 
and she's playing like a 16 year old. Yeah. So cow. and it's clear. I mean, I, I went back and watched 90210 <laughs> for some reason in 2018. And uh, yeah, you can. It, it doesn't. It's it doesn't obvious. ride very well. Oh, my God. Yeah. Dude. She, she almost like ran mom. me over in real life. I know I told that story. I know show. that's all. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And really? she's the head of the Screen Actors Guild now, which is. Even oh, weird. still today. Yeah. Oh, wow. She so. Owes me one. Yeah, maybe she does. I want to do some parts, maybe. Yeah, Barry does look the hey, hey Barry, I think it's time for you and the milkmaid to go home. I uh yeah, he's the one of the ones that that looks that looks the age, but let's br- bring up Kevin Nealon real quick. Okay. Now, I love I think Kevin Nealon's really funny, Mr. Cheezel. He's great in Weeds. That character in Weeds that he plays is really funny where he's just like the dad stoner character. And I've always loved his very reserved and and um staid humor. I think he's incredibly funny. And I think this character reminds me so much of people in the gaming industry because, and I'm sure in the animation industry too, for you, where it's like dudes at the top that have money and are maybe a little vision and whatever and kind of got things going are very disconnected. They're nice and they're decent enough so you don't really bust balls, but you don't really listen to them and you kind of just let them go about their business. And I love the scenes where I always always wonder when people can, and obviously they're shooting and they're blocking and doing all these different things to trick uh, viewers they're not doing it all in one shot but i always wonder when i see a person like kevin nealon on on the set how is everyone not just hysterically laughing as he's doing like the <laughs> you know like the the thing with his arms and he's like i was a bird you know i was a bird and and then i was i went with the fishes and i'd be like dying if i was in on set me too with that so what did you think of his performance as mr cheesel and do you know anyone that's like this because I actually really do. I mean, not like specific. I I could. It's like a composite of people that I definitely know. Okay. In the industry. Yeah. Who, sure. who like? Oh, in the gaming industry, you're saying definitely. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's why I think like yeah, the the visionaries at the top. That's why I was asking you about animation as well. Like I know people at the top of video. Not all of them are like that, obviously, but there are yeah. people like that. And and actually, the the film that Ubi or the TV show that Ubisoft does, I think on Apple Plus or whatever, that stars one of the guys from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Um. They do the gaming industry. They they run a gaming company, and it's kind of similar to that, where he's like a real doofus. <gasps> so anyway, yeah. What do you think about Mister? It's Diesel? so funny now. Those because he's like the new, of course, he's the new agey, crunchy, you know, type of boss. He's like you know, Middle Eastern philosophy type thing. Maybe he's into Buddhism, whatever it is. He's got the robes and the beads, and he sends them to the vegan restaurant for a celebration. Like he embodies the whole thing, but. What I love about Kevin Nealon is, and I don't really know that much about him, is that he does what, you know, exactly what you said. He just has a, that funny presence, almost like very Will Ferrell-like in that regard. Like, he just looks funny. You know, he just has that funny physicality to him and also plays the perfect character that's completely unaware of himself. Like, completely unaware of how ridiculous he is or that he's the butt of everybody's jokes, which makes it even funnier because it's like... You know, they're doubling down on who they are, this whole image or whatever it is, whether it's authentic or not. And sort of everybody's just like rolling their eyes. And I love that. You know, there's you could really play that for a lot of comedy and certain comedians are very good at it. And he's one of the ones like he was perfectly cast for this, you know, being the boss that's sort of like the dork, but thinks he's thinks he's cool and doesn't realize that everybody's laughing at him. So he just keeps, you know, he's and he's never going to. He's never he's just completely unaware, you know. And just or or, you know, just completely comfortable in his own skin, which is also, you know, which also makes it really funny. And again, one of the bigger comedic faces that pops up in a bit part, which I think is cool for two reasons. I think it's cool because they'll do that. And, you know, it's probably some quick cash for not a lot of work, a day's work or two days work or whatever. So I could understand it. But also because, you know, it's it's sort of like it seems to me or I want to think it's like friends helping friends out, you know, all these comedians slash actors, writers in the same network, jump in for each other's projects, kind of everybody pitches in or they're thought of for each other's things or whatever their own, their each other's vehicles, which is kind of neat. I love seeing like an ensemble comedic cast like this. Yeah, I, I do too. And I, I do love the point you're making about, and I've made repeatedly, which I think is a great point that in reversing the roles so that the big guys play the little roles, it, it enhances uh, the entire movie. I agree. And, uh, I, I do have to give it up to Nealon just because, again, I think when you are in a creative field and then you make good money, you, you, you people can tend to get a little away from themselves and away from reality. 
and I've met my share of rich creatives before, and he he strikes me as very very relatable in that way. <laughs> we talked about Linda Cardellini before, Samantha. This character strikes me as realistic too because um, she's a producer, and they don't. So this is the thing: is that the 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 whole way they're making this game doesn't even really make any sense. It's that's what's so funny about it. And I think it's self-aware enough to know like Alan Covert strikes me as a person who plays games. So I think he knows that it's it's ridiculous. Like they're they're testers and they all te- what are they? Te- it doesn't even make any sense. First of all, testers are not are like the lowest rung people at a game developer. Sure. Most of them are contractors. Yeah. Yeah. So it so it's uh, it's not no disrespect to them. They're important to the cycle, but it's. It's interesting because producers are often people, not always, but often people who don't necessarily play games, but who are organizational gurus. And so that aspect of it is realistic. And it is realistic for often big publishers. A lot of people don't know this, but it happens. A lot of people are not credited on games they work on. People go in and finish. People go in and make sure things are wrapped up um, and up to snuff. And so she was very relatable from that sense. It, it seemed like it was someone that was sent from their publisher. So you can you can they don't ever say any of these things, but you can kind of glean the information. They're a developer. They're working for a publisher. They have some sort of guru who makes all their games, some Miyamoto type character. They bring Miyamoto up, which I think is so <laughs> corny. Do. Very Miyamoto. Um, so I do dig this. Um, this particular approach to realism in the game industry. She's a producer, maybe a Jade Raymond type. and at the same time having this unrealistic way in which they're making the game and all of that, which no one really knows or cares about, but she does a really nice job. I also must say, you know, be still my beating heart, Linda Cardellini, because I'm in love with you. But (laughs) what did you think of her role in this? She's so good, man. I mean, yeah, obviously she's very attractive and pretty, but she just seems like she's having fun in the things that she does. You know, we talked about freaks and geeks. We talked about her turn on Mad Men. So serious acting chops and, I didn't realize, too, I looked at her filmography and then I checked out some scenes on YouTube. I didn't realize she was in um, Brokeback Mountain. I forgot. And I haven't seen that movie in a really long time. And again, it's sort of like those the, the way she could go from stoner comedy to like a really, you know, quote unquote, important movie like Brokeback Mountain is like super. And, you know, her turn on Mad Men and freaks and geeks to do a you know an iconic television series that's that has a huge cult filing like she just she just does it all and she seems like she's having a great time she seems like she's all in doesn't seem like she never seems like she's phoning it in and i love her in this part too because if you you know you harken back to when this came out to 2006 before social media really became big before obviously before youtube even became very big you know now the super hot or super good looking nerdy girl is a thing you know it's it's everywhere and not only you know good looking but also very well informed and and really good at what they do you know maybe they know film really well maybe they know video games as well as anybody else but that's like a common thing now Mm. but back then you know the hot nerdy chick what especially in video games wasn't a big thing yet so this was sort of like pre you know pre that whole era and you know again like sort of like played for comedy in this and not taken too seriously, but really the ultimate nerd fantasy is like a girl that comes in. Now she's the boss. She's the production manager. She's, you know, she's called in to get this thing on track to get the project on track and get it completed on time. I've known a lot of production managers, male and female in animation, not in video games, but that's a, that's a hard job because you're sort of the mid middleman. You're sort of the liaison between the creatives, a lot of the creatives and the upper management. So, and she plays it really appealingly because I've known all types. I've known really cool ones and I've known really nervous ones and I've known ones that were less easy to get along with. But I like her. She's very appealing. We kind of, we see her let her hair down. She does that awesome salt and pepper karaoke scene, which I think is so fun. Like, and you know, again, like just being all in, like that's Linda Cardellini killing it. Like, you know, she's so good in that scene and so much fun. And she, you know, she anchors it with that performance too. I think you need that, you know, you need the comedy to kind of orbit around that one character. She's funny too, but you need the comedy to kind of orbit around that one character who, you know, is universally likable, very appealing. All the characters like her and, you know, just, just super fun. I don't think she could have been cast any better. You could have had other attractive women in the role, but she just plays it. She just plays it so perfectly in every way. Um, what about and I I, I have to uh, ask you 
Um, I, I guess I'm kind of curious what you think about her relationship with. It's kind of a per, it's kind of a predictable thing that she ends up with. Um, you know, with the protagonist as opposed to something sure. else interesting. Do you do you think? Did you want anything else for that, or did you? Is that That's kind a good of the, question? Is that kind of the logical conclusion? Because I don't want to come. I, I guess I was saying because I don't want to come off as like a downer or anything like that. No, um, but Alan Covert and you know Alex ending up with her. It would have been cool if if it ended in some other way. It just seemed a little predictable to me. Yeah, it, I guess it does. It does lend to the the comedy. Uh, yeah, could I mean you could have made her the rivalry up. the rivalry with JP and all that. Yeah, you, know, you could have you could have that would have been interesting to end up you know with the with the because you know of course JP becomes he's sort of the antagonist from the beginning, but he certainly becomes the antagonist after what he does. It would have been that would have been really interesting. I always think that right like. Just take a shot. Like, I know it's five million. I know there's a lot of who's involved. I know it's an Adam Sandler production. But, like, just do something that really flies in the face of what's usually done and just, like, make her end up with the antagonist. It's really weird, but, like, at least people would talk about it for that, you know? So it seems kind of, like, worthwhile just to experiment. But it's a, gr- it's a great question. Yeah, it seems a little unrealistic. I mean, the Alex character, the only thing I could say about him is he's a little more normal than his compatriots you know, than his cronies, you know, the young guys are just out of their minds. Jeff has obviously got his, you know, his um, foibles. And then you have the JP character who's completely out of his, you know, completely out of his gourd. So in that respect, it seems like, you know, Alex is at least a sort of, you could, you could see it at least personality wise. He's not completely, he hasn't completely lost his marbles yet. You know, although what do you think? I'm you know, sorry, still living at grandma's house, but that's true. Well, he's brought JP. Uh, Joel uh, Moore plays him pretty well known actually for his role these days in Avatar um, and the upcoming Avatar films as well. But this character is funny too because I it's a very it's a very over the top version, but everyone knows the painfully, awfully nerdy. Just <laughs> the gaming industry breeds these people; they're everywhere, and it doesn't come off as that unbelievable like only like the robot thing and stuff is maybe like and obviously his like ridiculous office but him wearing like a trench coat and like glasses and <laughs> trying to like blend into the wall and shit like there are people that do like there i just have known people like this definitely in the that's gaming so industry crazy that's and awesome so he's like the auteur or whatever at this dev which is bernasium i think they call it yeah. and so what did you think of uh, his performance? The one thing that bothered me about this, and again, it just goes into the unrealistic nature of the story, which doesn't matter in a movie like this, but there's no, pr- how did he, he made this game and there's no proof that he didn't make the game. I mean, there's nothing in there. <gasps> Alan Covert doesn't have like all of the files on his computer and like all, it's just, it's totally ri- ridiculous. It's hysterical. Oh my God, but- so funny. But and what I love you think that about the his guy, these are one man productions. Like they do all the art, they do all the programming. These are like yeah. savants, you know? To the nth it's degree. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So it's funny. funny. I didn't know what did a you lot think about, about yeah. this guy. I didn't know a lot about Joel David Moore before I watched this. I knew I saw him in something, and then that turned out to be you know, a common theme for me in this movie. But I knew then I realized, like, okay, I've, he's he was in Dodgeball, you know, not too, not too many years prior. So I knew he was from that. But, yeah, like you said, the painfully eccentric savant video game developer who's like a prodigy you know he says he's he beat the legend of zelda before he learned how to walk so he has this whole thing going for him but of course like he can't just be this genius creator he's got to be extremely odd and he models himself physically after the matrix and he acts like a robot the acting like a robot thing is so crazy like it's so stupid and painful to watch but then you just want to keep watching it you just want to rewatch those scenes over and over again you know that whole thing with uh um what does he say at the end he says uh um farewell turd nuggets or oh adios turd nuggets you know after he shoots it like it's just like it's so it's so silly i love the way it's just kind of exaggerated for comedy and the fact that he's kind of harmless though like he's obviously obnoxious he's aloof he thinks slash knows how great he is but then he doesn't really do anything until he steals the game very late in the movie that's probably like 12 minutes before the end of the film by the way, this film ends very abruptly. I was shocked when the movie ended. Yeah. I was just like, "What? It's, wait, what? That's it? It's over? Like that's where it's ending? That's got to be a mistake." So funny, but you know, it's it's funny to have an antagonist character too, who you don't really realize is going to be. In fact, you know, he comes to Alex 
and you know sort of laments like being left out like that's how the whole thing starts and then of course that whole real unrealistic thing with alex like oh i have a copy of the game i've been working on tirelessly for three years here's the one disc of it you know i did i never backed it up anywhere yeah so please every time be i compile the it. game every time i compile the game i delete all evidence of it <laughs> <clears throat> So, so yeah, it, it was it was very strange, but it, it doesn't matter. I, I actually think that it's fun that it leans into in some way. It's it's over the topness because it just makes it very clear it, it, over and over again, basically, that you shouldn't that you shouldn't take it seriously. Yeah, we touched about we touched on some of his friends already, but um, I got to say, Je I love the Jeff character played by uh, Nick Swartzen. I think it's hysterical that because you could see like the whole jerking off on his like he jerks off on his mom. It's hysterical. <laughs> And then the scene where she like drives up and they make eye contact when he's waiting outside. It's just so <laughs> funny and so dumb. And then just how they keep referencing that joke over and over again. It's like, you know, so he's, he yells out and asks if he could stay at someone's house and uh, Bobby or whatever. And he's like, hey, what do you want to come on my mom or something like that? He's like riding away. <laughs> it's so funny, but it's also funny about how nonchalant that is. Like, it's just not even that big of a deal that would like ruin someone's life. Uh, Can basically. you imagine? But do you and then Jonah Hill is funny as Barry, but I do think the scene, the scene with him and the and the chick is so over the top and the the under the unrated version of the movie is only a minute longer. And it's basically just him playing with with her. Oh, Ooh. wow. That's all it is. Um, yeah. And wow. yeah, it's, so it's it's so it's super ridiculous at the end with with him. But what did you think of those kind of complimentary characters? We already talked about Kane as well. Yeah. Well, you know, <clears throat> I love the Jeff character. I love the whole thing where he's sort of like a man child, but he's in complete denial. You know, referring to the parents as roommates was brilliant. The car bed, brilliant. You know, the fact that my roommates are going to get me new rims for the car bed for Christmas. Like, that whole thing was, like, so good. Or maybe I'm going to get CB so I could talk to other car beds. Like, not only, it's like, not only is he a complete man child, but, like, he's just, he's all in. Like, he's completely, that's, that's his whole thing. And... So hilarious. I love the character. And then later on, we see how good he is at like DDR and he's taking on the younger guys. And he's actually really a funny character. He, he's actually he is self-aware. It turns out like he's not, you know, I love the way he goes like the younger guys at the office and stuff like that. Super, super funny. And the Barry thing, it was funny with the, the, the sucking on the girls boobies at the party for 13 hours or whatever it was like that and the the very early masturbation scene the iconic masturbation scene i really thought especially for the masturbation bit which comes very early in the movie i really thought there was going to be a lot more gross out stuff in the movie that was going to keep going in that direction it really wasn't besides the barry and the girl at the party and the masturbation scene there's really not that much of that and even like the restraint they showed in the masturbation scene like you would expect to see some like liquid flying up or something yeah. <laughs> they don't do any of that yeah like know? always there's something about mary kind of style very good point right. very good comparison you know i feel like they could have you know obviously for you know just for making bank on a, on a movie and making a profit you don't really want to push things into an nc-17 territory but i feel like they could have pushed this r a lot harder like sometimes you know, I feel like they could have taken it and they didn't for whatever reason, you know, maybe they was just weren't going for that. But I feel like this movie could have had a lot more of that. And for some reason it did it has very funny moments. I mean, like the grandma thing with the dead Sophie character where she's like, you know, he's she's like, why didn't you help me? You know, and he's like, I would have yeah. Sophie. I just wasn't here. Then she pops up. Like, <laughs> like It's like you have so much good comedy without that. But I was yeah, just definitely. surprised there wasn't more you know, of that sort of brand of that sort of flavor of comedy. I do love when the, and we'll talk about the grandmas next, but uh, the grandma and her cat and their roommates went uh, next. But I love when, um, when Jeff is the, the grandma's coming to the office, they realize that this ruse about how he has crazy roommates that are keeping him up all night or whatever is, is ridiculous. And, and Jeff says, uh, jerking off on my mother is one thing, but banging your own grandmother and her roommates is legendary. <laughs> <laughs> so good it's so th that shit is fucking crazy it's, uh, it's so funny so yeah let's talk about the the ladies uh obviously led by the famous doris roberts r.i.p and of course shirley jones and shirley knight as well as grace and b um doris roberts is a pretty big name for this film yeah and she does a and she does a really nice job i love the the scene when you first she's very grandmother like she's letting um alex into sophie's room and he, and she's 
he's like, she didn't die in bed, did she? And he's like, no, she fell out of bed and died right here. <laughs> Points at the ground. So, so she good. she does a really nice job. And I must say as well, and I just have to give a shout out to this, the tackle box full of pills is for B is one of the fucking funniest and like underplayed bit. Like, again, another thing you could tell they had an idea of like, what if there was a character with just a tackle box of pills? So funny. And I think it's so funny. And she carries it around with her and stuff. So what did you think about the the lovely ladies of Grandma's Boy? I mean, Grandma Lily. You know what's you know what's a cool thing that I wanted to tell you guys about Doris Mae Roberts. I worked in New York for many. You know, I still work in New York for many years. And when I used to com- commute all the time, I would be more prone to see people on the street. You know, famous who's and actors and stars and all that. But I never saw too many. Colin knows that. Like I would have friends and colleagues that would see such and such on a lunch break and I would never see anybody here and there, you know, and I saw some cool ones. I saw Mick Jagger. I saw saw Steven Tyler one time. But so I have my good ones over the years, but I would see Doris Roberts. There was a period of time where I would see her on the street like almost every day. She would just be passing, I think, to go to lunch. Sesame was near a lot of nice, really nice, you know, sort of upper end lunch spots. So a lot of people would be in the area around lunchtime. And I would see her a lot. And the the striking thing about her was that she never really tried to seem to be in disguise or incognito or hiding. And she was also extremely tiny. I mean, I'm a, I'm 5'10", so I'm not you know, judging from on high. You know, she was really, really, really short. You know, you would never know that from... You know, just seeing her on camera and everyone loves Raymond or something like that. And of course, everyone knows her from that. And I think it's a, it's kind of an extent. Well, she's a little more obnoxious in Everybody Loves Raymond. You know, here yeah. she plays that sort of very doting, coddling, loving, sort of unquestioning, un, you know, love, unconditional love grandma. You know, very sweet, very appealing, very likable. And again, really important to say, another f- kind of feminine, female grounding agent in the movie, which is her acting chop. She's very believable in that role. You don't look at her performance and be, you know, say, oh, she's really acting a great part. She feels like a grandma. Yeah. You know, she looks Definitely. and acts the part, which is really cool. Yeah, you she's know. great. And I I love just the idea of, I don't know, it's, it is, it, you said it earlier, but the very reminiscent of the Golden Girls, uh, older widows who, or whatever, who find themselves alone late in life and they live together but they have this kind of comedic um interaction with each other and the addiction to antiques roadshow is amongst oh. that's iconic because we used to make fun of that in college and people used to make fun of me because i loved antiques roadshow so, so good. it's all i can watch antiques road especially because pbs has no commercials so back and you can watch it now on demand and stuff but I used to love watching PBS, particularly because you just didn't have to roll through these commercials. They'd have like, you know, their five minutes at the end where it'd be like, you know, brought to you by. But but they so I used to just really get into those various shows. That's why I love Nova and Frontline and all these fucking awesome shows. And an Antiques Roadshow is another one of those shows hosted by Mark L. Wahlberg. And I used to always love how he used to have to say that he was Mark L. Wahlberg. <laughs> he had also did the that, that. Yeah, he had, I always felt bad for him. Like, oh, man, that sucks. But I love how they just it, it, there's so many funny angles to the story about how he like gets the cable box from Dante and that they end up becoming addicted to. That's right. Um, it's an antiques roadshow. And so he, there's only one TV, I guess, in the house and he can't. So it's like so ridiculous. It's like you can't get any. I remember because I remember I worked at a video game st- uh, company for a long time. We used to have all sorts of shit. I mean, people just take shit from that office all the time, you know, uh, TVs and gaming systems and every game you can imagine and, and all the rest. So. Uh, but I, I did love them together and it was just funny and it's cute. And I especially love the whole, uh, and I wrote it down. Like I gave a hand job. I gave, a, I once gave a Charlie Chaplin a hand job is one of the, is one of the great lines as well. Oh, the grace character, dude. So yeah, good. She's, really? Yeah, she's Shirley, awesome. Jones, Shirley Jones. I'm like, wait, she's one of those women who aged really well. And I, you know, like just kept up, like she, she, she was beautiful so she kept that physical beauty, also extremely charismatic, but, you know, just like did it the right way. Like the sh- really looks good with that short hairstyle, like more contemporary old lady, you know, older woman looks very sophisticated. But I didn't realize that was the mom from the Partridge, from the Partridge family. family. I was like, wait yeah. a second. You know, it was like an epiphany for me. Yeah, it's awesome. And, she, you know, she, what I love about it, first of all, she's still alive and she was in her early 70s when she filmed this. So I just I dug that 
a little tidbit just because it's like well, she's cool man she's fun so cool and, you know she's she's in her 70s and she, this is a raunchy stoner comedy she probably didn't get paid very much for it she doesn't probably need the money and you just i like that kind of stuff where it's the same thing with doris roberts where it's, it's it, to me it's it's like you're funny you're really funny it, it, you're not you're not just nbc or cbs 24 minute funny you're funny it's a great in a point. stoner comedy where jonah hill is, is sucking on some girl's tits you know? and, <laughs> and you're cool with that then you want to be in it's that. a great point dude absolutely and like you have to probably i would imagine you get an actress like that or actresses like that you kind of have to clear that whole thing with them it's like you know there's gonna be she's on everybody's love everyone loves raymond when this is on, when this comes out so it's like yeah. you probably have to balance all that stuff and so i think it says a lot about some of the people that were involved that and obviously of course we have you know rob schneider and david spade and others um kevin nash is one of the movers in the beginning it's funny so that's right the, so the, there's a lot of of people that are like kind of um you wouldn't expect necessarily to be associated with a lowbrow comedy like this. It actually reminds me a lot of Dirty Grandpa, which is Robert De Niro, which is 10 times raunchier than this. Yes. Where, and that movie is, uh, as I've said so many times, hysterical. So I fun. love I love inappropriate movies. And I think that that's what I love about this movie. I love inappropriate movies. This movie is not that inappropriate, though. I actually think this movie, with the exception of a couple of scenes, could be watched by like your kids. When you remove the scene at at, at um, Jeff's house and you remove the party scene and yeah. there's nothing bad in there, really. No. And when you compare it to 40 year old virgin pussy juice cocktail, my favorite line in that. Uh, or you per, you compare it to all the other contemporary super bad, even although yeah, it's not oh that gosh. bad. But I don't know. There's something special about these early aughts comedies, specifically because I just don't think that you can get away with making these anymore. That's I mean, a imagine, really great point. Yeah, I mean, imagine a, a situation. I mean, maybe you could if you and I, I don't know, but racial humor. Um, there's a lot of gay humor in this, you know, basically. And actually, Micah was talking about it, which is an interesting undercurrent. The Grace character is convinced that Alex is gay and says it over and over again. And you kind of wonder, like, oh, um, would would this kind of homophobic line be? okay today or would people understand it's comedy no and it's humor yeah. would dr shakalu be okay today i really doubt it especially the like when alex clicks at him it's hysterical but i don't know i don't i just don't so this almost seems like a special movie because it's kind of towards the end of when people started ruining everything for everybody else. You, you know it's a great point dude very specific era you would have to do it differently now unquestioning i think you would have to do it a little different differently now and yeah i love the the part you made about i really was expecting the raunchy levels of a dirty grandpa or at least a super bad but it was different it, you know that makes this movie a little different in in that regard and i you know again a shout out to shirley jones for playing the grace character i think that sort of blanche Devereux type character is kind of timeless and i think there's only certain actresses that could kind of pull off that sort of older aging cougar seductress whatever you want to call it and the whole thing with her experiences of like you know world war one and world war two and yeah. giving charlie chaplin a hand job and like all that kind of and talking about like other you know famous older actors and stuff like that well Just like, i think the i think the world war one world war two thing was funny especially because like she definitely didn't experience world no, war one not at you all. know so that that whole line was like hysterical it's like no she's not that old jeff's she's understanding like, of like yeah it's a little hysterical. off it's hysterical so good. and so there's not much more to say. I mean, this is one of the for me anyway. This is one of those movies where I feel like you should watch it. Comedies are kind of hard to cover because they're just very quotable and they're funny and they're um, it's this. It's kind of like horror where it's viscera. You kind of yeah. have to you have to be there and understand it and see it in context. You can't really it, in Grandma's Boy. It's hard to say. Like, you remember the scene when they delivered the build of, you know, Eternal Death Slayer three or whatever. It's like. <laughs> It's different. You have to be there to watch the beat by beat comedy for it. But there's so much. There's so many great one liners. And um, it's I'm glad that you understood it to the level I feel like I do where it's it is watchable on YouTube. It's it's a it's a funny movie where you want to watch it all. But then you kind of want to relive it. It reminds me a lot of the Chappelle show where I'm, I'm fine not watching 80 percent of the Chappelle show ever again. I've seen seasons one, two and then two, especially many times. But there are certain things like the player haters ball or, you know, the the um, the race draft or whatever they do and all of that. 
where you want to watch those things again. Absolutely. And this movie has a lot of those particular scenes, especially anything with Dr. Shockley is, is just absolute gold to me. But is there anything that we didn't touch on that you wanted to talk about, Dick? No, you know, it's well said, you know, it's a movie built on moments that, you know, take the hour and a half, watch it. It's a quick watch, a lot of fun. But yeah, then you do like you really do want to just watch the clip reel after that because of the one liners, because of those silly moments, those iconic, like legendary moments. I'm finally, you know, it's nice to finally get a glimpse into that. I wanted to ask you if you knew anything about this, Kyle. Yeah, of course, the JP character in this world, in the film has created the eternal death slayer franchise like he yes. cr- you know supposedly created the first one when he was very young and you see like the standees for number two in the background of the video game dev studio so that's kind of cool thoughtful little touch and then of course they're working on three in the, over the course of the movie but you have the alex character who's creating his little project on the side that demonic game which was supposedly a real game in development by yes. uh, Terminal Reality. Is that the name yep, of the Terminal studio? Reality. Yeah. So what a, happened with that? Apparently the game never came out, but that was sort of a marketing tie-in with this movie. It didn't pan out the way they had anticipated. But what do you know about that? Because I was fascinated, but I couldn't find out a lot. Yeah, I don't think there is much about it. I, I, as I understood it, and I could be wrong, as I understood it, the game was built by Terminal Reality and could have maybe turned into something else, but I think was just a kind of a proof of concept that they maybe used and reskinned because it's important to note. And a lot of people will be, this will be relevant to a lot of our gaming audiences that there's, there's so many shout outs and brand deals in this, including prominent ones with Xbox and obviously EA prominently shows fight night in the game. And yeah, there's a lot of, and there's a, actually a lot of, you know, DDRs in it. So Konami got involved. There are a lot of metal gear solid posters. So that's another that's amazing. Konami thing. Game Dallas Informer posters are everywhere. In so yeah, game informers everywhere. Guild Wars, city of heroes. There's a lot of cool stuff. Actually, if you pay attention to the backgrounds, there's a lot of fake stuff. And then there's a lot of real stuff. And um, the terminal reality connection is, I think largely unknown because uh, I think that that might have just been a build because I, I, I read about that, too, a while ago. And Terminal Reality in and of itself is a strange studio because I really don't even know what they're doing. They made um, that 2009 Ghostbusters game and they made like a Connect Star Wars game and stuff, but they still exist. But I think that it's just a private studio that does basically what it wants. So I, don't, I, I just don't think it ever worked out for them. But um, I do love the prominent Xbox it's an act. Oh, it's so movie's fun. an Xbox ad. It's cool to see the the um, Xbox S controller. I think it was the smaller one, not the Duke. And then you know, obviously the fat old console. So yeah, definitely check it out. I had to buy it on Amazon digitally for ten bucks, but I was happy to do that. It might be available on streaming services if you check that out. But highly recommended to check out Grandma's Boy. Just a, a very watchable, fun, um, Happy Madison production. Absolutely, that, dude. That I think is a nice little tie, you know, a little bow on a, on a strange E3. So um, <laughs> that's fun. That's a fun tie. And I like that, you know, and a shout out to the soundtrack. Very emblematic of the mid 2000s. I find Definitely. myself getting increasingly nostalgic yes. for that period of time as I get older. You know, now we're talking about 15 years ago. It's like, wow, I'm getting nostalgic for a period of time I didn't anticipate getting nostalgic for. You know, I've been I've been nostalgic for the 90s for a while. Obviously, I'm old enough for that. But, you know, same thing with the gear, like you were saying earlier, like the DC T-shirts and the Etnies and like the clothes you would see that was very authentic to that period. The music and the soundtrack, same thing. Like it just puts you in that, even though it's a comedy movie, although it's, you know, over the top and far flung, the, the music kind of grounds you in that in that era. And it's like, wow, yeah, dude, I remember that song where I forgot about that band. So definitely worth checking out for that, you know, for that too, which is, you know, which is you know, a big part of the experience, I think, with a movie like this, especially for someone who's nostalgic, you know. Sure. There's no trouble, bro. They're just people like you and me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dave, let's end with a uh, dad joke. All right, I got a good one from frequent dad joke contributor, Brian Henninger. By the way, I'm I'm at the Shore House. I'm down at the Jersey Shore, This so hence the, the different background this. And I just have to show you who I have here with me. Okay. This is... Oh. There she is. You know who what this is? What is that? This is Sand Crab Baby. Now, this was either Helene's or her younger sister's doll from no clothes. Not dressed right now, Sand Crab Baby. But she could put her on there. There we go. Put her on yeah, mic. That's a, that's a shore house staple. I'm going to just throw her in the crib. And then I have one other... I have one other guest for you guys. Here. You're going to like this one. 
There he is. What the that's hell is guy. that? Is that a troll? That's a troll, though. Oh, man, that's horrifying. Uh, I think that thing's got to go in the garbage. That's there's he, all, that, isn't there that's, also a painting that's scary at your at your in-laws shore house? Didn't wasn't I went there once and I was like fi fixated on this painting. I don't remember what it was at the shore. Yeah, I don't I got to remember what it was like. It's it was some something I was like fixated on. I remember us joking about, but I don't know. Maybe it wasn't scary. Maybe it was like silly or something, but I don't remember. It was years ago now. Maybe so. we'll get the tickly monster down here for you. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, Kyle. All right, all right, hit me with that joke. Let's go out with this one, you guys. Someone here has been stealing the wheels off of police cars. They've been working tirelessly to find the criminal. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out That's to Brian. Good. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate you. Uh, and thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support of our show. Knockback. Remember, support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash laststandmedia. We'll have a huge back catalog of knockback episodes available for you to f free as well, but we couldn't do it without your support there. Sacred Symbols um, and Defining Duke roll on all the rest. That's basically it. Dig, any closing comments before we go? No. Thank you for watching. Make us bigger than Sacred Symbols. I yeah, that would be Dude, if you make us bigger than Sacred Symbols, that would be really great. What? I mean, so, can you imagine? It's never I could imagine, happen. actually. Yeah, I could imagine that. We just have to keep working at it. <laughs> Let's uh, keep working. All right. Thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support. Hope you enjoyed E3 as well. I'm so tired. I need to I need to rest from oh, E3. You must be beat. But it, it happens. It is what it is. It's a good time of year. It's an exciting time of year. But we'll see you guys next time for more. Until then, goodbye. Knockback, a retro and nostalgia podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded from Central Virginia and the Philadelphia suburbs, USA. The show is conceived by and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Dagan Moriarty. Knockback's executive producer is Dustin Furman, and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. Stan's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including Knockback, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level or higher on Patreon, and we're grateful for your kindness and generosity. 